kindly remain standing for the word. It's taken from the book of Acts, chapter 15, verses 36 to 41. Then after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us now go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Now Barnabas was determined to take with them John called Mark, but Paul insisted that they should not take with them the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. Then the contention became so sharp that they parted from one another. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by the brethren to the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Father, we just want to thank you for today's word. We ask, Lord, that you will give us all a fresh revelation of what we need to learn about disagreements. And Lord, anoint my mouth as I speak. Please be seated. Is there anyone in this room who has never been in an argument? Never been in any disagreement? Just raise your hands, I want to see. All of us at some point or the other get into a disagreement with someone. So we look here, two great people who did, who were strong in ministry, even they faced disagreement and how they solved it. Did you know that Christians disagree about everything? And when we disagree, we usually start a new church. Although we like to sing, we are one body and we share in one cup. And we sing another song, we are one in the spirit, we are one in the Lord. Christians are mostly united about their love of dividing. How else can you explain the different denominations under the Christian banner? You know that when Jesus was there, there was only one church. If you think about the number of denominations we have today, it was not because God wanted it to, for us to be in different places. It's because man does not like to walk in unity and are always disagreeing with one another. If you doubt this, check out Wikipedia called List of Christian Denominations. You will find hundreds of it. For all our talk about unity, Christians not only disagree, we enjoy our disagreements. Today we look in the book of Acts, verses 36 to 41, how these two great missionaries, Paul and Barnabas, disagree. Before with that, I want to read to you something. The story is told of a little boy who got into an argument with some boys twice his size. He drew a line in the dirt and dared the bigger boys to cross the line. The bigger boys accepted the challenge and crossed the line. Immediately, the little boy smiled and announced, Look, now we are on the same side. Don't you wish conflict resolutions were that easy? Let's just be on the same side. And I tell you which side? is Jesus' side, because Jesus' side is always the winning side. There is another story told about a sharp dispute that divided worshippers of an ancient synagogue in Eastern Europe. The disagreement surrounded whether they should stand or sit during the reciting of the Shema, which is that wonderful prayer found in Deuteronomy 6, 4-9. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. The Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. It continues till verse 9. Half of the worshippers insisted on standing. The other half just adamantly remained seated during the prayer. Those who were seated 
often yelled at those who were standing to sit down. The ones on the feet screamed at those sitting to rise out of respect to the Almighty. You can imagine what a wonderful worship experience was created by this chaos. This group's rabbi was a renowned scholar and a wise man, but this fuss had him at his wit's end. Someone suggested that they consult a 98-year-old member of the synagogue, the only surviving founder of the group. So with the representative of each faction in tow, the rabbi set out to the nursing home, quite sure that his position would be affirmed. The leader of the standards asked the old man, is it the tradition to stand during the Shema? No, the old man answered quietly, that is not the tradition. So being the sitter's top man, the tradition really is to sit down during the prayer. No, the old man countered sadly, that is not the tradition. The rabbi then said with tears of frustration, my congregants fight all the time about this. Every time we gather to worship, they begin yelling at each other to sit or to stand. Ah, yes, the old man interrupted him. That is the tradition. That is, fighting arguments is the tradition. And I'm sure our God does not want us to have that tradition for his people. He does not want us Christians to be characterized by conflict and division, but by peace and unity. Jesus prayed for his followers in John 17. In many of Paul's letters to the churches, he pleads with them to be of one mind and heart. In his letter to the Philippians, chapter 4, verses 2 and 3, he even pleads with two women who are in conflict to agree with each other in the Lord. He calls on the entire congregation to help these two women to get along with each other. One of the wonderful things about the Bible is when God has spoken about his prophets or his people in this Bible, the great people, I mean the ones he used, he not only talks about their great achievements through him, of course, but he talks about their flaws as well. Moses was a murderer. David, adultery and hypocrisy. Abraham lied more than once. Jacob had deceitful ways. Jonah was proud, stubborn and disobedient prophet. Peter spoke and acted evasively when cornered. John the Baptist struggled with doubt. Thomas also. And there are many more like that you find in the Bible. Since scripture does not hide about these great men of God, you should not be surprised when you hear that there was a disagreement between Paul and Barnabas. So let us see how that happened. In Acts 14, Paul and Barnabas have finished the first missionary journey. They've planted numerous churches, they have appointed elders, and have well known now that they are the ones who are carrying out the Lord's work. Then they were summoned to Jerusalem over a debate of circumcision. And Acts 15, 1 to 35 talks how the Jerusalem council wanted to address this problem of the Jews being circumcised. After careful consideration, calm discussions, they reached a decision that there was no need for the Gentiles to be circumcised, but they were to abstain from food sacrificed to idol, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. You see how people love to say, put rules. God does not put rules. He wants us to come to him freely. He sees the condition of your heart, not what you wear, 
not what you sing, not what you speak, but the condition of your heart when you approach him. I wish the next disagreement that is found in Acts 15, 36 to 41 could have ended amicably as well. Paul suggested to Barnabas, let us go to the places where we visited and check how the churches are doing there. A follow-up is always very good. But Barnabas wanted to take John Mark. But Paul didn't think it was wise to take John Mark. So, they argued. The more heated the verbal debate became, neither per party gave up ground. Finally, they decided to part ways. The idea of going on the trip, both agreed. But who should go with them was the problem. Paul and Barnabas were very good, godly people. But it is important to remember, even good, godly people are not perfect people. It is, let us stop here and learn what we should do when we have strong disagreements. A disagreement is a conflict that involves an issue seen from op opposing points of view. If you have a topic we want to discuss, all of us agree there is no disagreement. But when we don't, we don't see eye to eye, there comes disagreement. So, it is helpful to remember that in every disagreement, there may be one issue, but there can be several viewpoints. We must realize that viewpoints are subjective. In the sense, there is a problem here between Paul and Barnabas. And he has his own views, Paul and Barnabas has his own. Now, suppose you are there. You may be supporting one and not supporting the other. It is subjective. Both viewpoints have their strength and weaknesses. In heated disagree uh, disagreements, someone usually gets hurt. The more intense the argument, the deeper the wounds. This is especially true when you start character assassination. When someone calls insulting names or attacks your character, the result is you are inflicting a wound on that person, which is sometimes slow to heal, sometimes may never heal. For this reason, when we find ourselves in disagreement, we must ask God for help and keep our mind calm and open our mouth only in a godly way. Just don't say everything that comes up on your mind. Sometimes when people argue, they say, I gave him my peace of my mind. Oh, good for you. Keep your peace for yourself. Oh, before you open your mouth, you ask, is it right what I'm going to say? I tell you, usually when you have a problem, just sleep overnight. You will find tomorrow morning, you don't want to say the things that you would have said yesterday. Keep a cool mind. If there's ice in the refrigerator, go and put it there. Before you open your mouth, ask the Holy Spirit to put a guard there. And I'd like to say, zip it up. So let us now, with an open mind, try to understand both the sides of the conflict between Paul and Barnabas. Let's present it in the form of a question. Should a person who once walked away from a serious responsibility be given a second chance. John Mark, when he went for the first missionary trip, left it halfway and went back. No reason is mentioned in the Bible. So, suppose it was a trip, a first missionary trip, and someone just walks away. What should you do with such a person? Should someone who leaves people in the lurch later be allowed to go on a similar mission? 
That is the question that is facing Paul and Barnabas. So how does each one of them answer it? Barnabas says, yes, by all means, let us take John Mark. Paul says, no, absolutely not. Both had opposing views. First of all, let's see what was Barnabas' point of view. Barnabas was interested in building up John Mark. He was very young. Acts 15, 37 says, Barnabas was determined to take with them John called Mark. Determined means his will. You should take him. Barnabas may have said something like this to Paul. The young man has every right to take the trip with us. Must have walked away. No one's denying that. But nobody is perfect. He's young and inexperienced. His leaving, I agree, made it hard for us. But he needs our encouragement. What else are we mentors for? If not to give encouragement and affirmation to the weak. Keep in mind also, John Mark was a cousin of Barnabas. So there was bias, there was favoritism. So let us look at Paul's viewpoint. It was as passionate as Barnabas. In Acts 15, 38, he says, but Paul insisted that they should not take with them this one who had departed. Paul kept on insisting it's not wise to take such a person with us. Paul is saying, yes, John Mark was a quitter. Faithfulness is priority in God's eyes and in my eyes. Therefore, he is not going to go with us. We just can't take another chance, another risk with him. So if Barnabas was concerned about John Mark, Paul was concerned about the mission. Barnabas was looking to the future, but Paul hadn't got over the present. Paul felt they needed someone whom they could count on. John Mark could not be depended upon. So who was right, Paul or Barnabas? Both viewpoints had strengths and weaknesses. No quick answer can be found or solution. Perhaps you are feeling overly generous at this time and say, what do you think Paul is thinking about? Why can't he give John a break? But before you get too magnanimous about it, let me ask you a question. If you trusted somebody and gave them your car, and the person wrecked the car the last time you loaned it to them. When they come back again to ask for your car again, will you be so generous as to say, here are the key, take it and go? Or you'll think 10 times before you give something to that person. So that is what happened between Paul and Barnabas. That is why they had such a sharp disagreement, no doubt. When we are having a disagreement, sometimes it's good to look at scriptures. Paul could have quoted from Proverbs 25, 19. Confidence in an unfaithful man in time of trouble is like a bad tooth, tooth and a foot out of joint. And Barnabas could have quoted from Psalm 103, 2 to 4. Bless the Lord, O my soul, forget not all his benefits, who forgives all our iniquities who heals all our diseases, who redeems our life from destruction, who crowns us with loving kindness and tender mercies. God, no doubt, when you say forgive, is a God of second chances, but he also holds us accountable. Remember that. When you say sorry, he gives you a second chance, but he holds you accountable for what you've done wrong. So they parted ways. We find that in Acts 15, 39 to 41. They go in the opposite direction. Barnabas goes with John Mark. They sailed southwest. Paul and Silas traveled north. So instead of one team, now we have two teams. I wish the conflict would have ended nicely, amicably. 
because when we think that there is an argument and the people have parted, we say Satan has won the victory. But I'd like to tell you, Satan tried to divide, but God multiplied. God always has the last say. It will never be over till God says it's over. Praise God for that. In the midst of problem, he is able to make you victorious when it looks as if you've been defeated. You got to look at that great God. Some significant effective churches have been birthed because of conflict. Mercifully, God is able to work around and even though some of our own imperfections and sinfulness. So how do you discover God's will in areas where Christians disagree? Don't think that because you're a Christian, you are all holy, holy. We are all holy, holy in presence of God. The minute we walk out of that door, oh, we're trying to throttle one another. You believe that? That's what it is. So we need a change of heart. So let's see what happens. Christians have been disagreeing with each other since the very beginning. When you read Romans and 1 Corinthians, you discover that Christians disagree on things like eating meat offered to idols, about the Sabbath day, whether to eat meat or vegetables, whether to drink or not to drink wine. In Colossae, the church was torn by controversy over the proper role of angels and the new moon celebration and the proper diet for spiritual Christians. In Thessalonica, the young church was deeply confused about the second coming of Christ. In Philippi, there was evidently a major power struggle within the church, which is why the Philippians contained such a strong plea for unity. So everyone, you see, it started from the Garden of Eden, it continues till today, and it will continue till Jesus comes back again for his church. There are some fundamental doctrines of Christian that Christians believe. The Trinity, the deity of Jesus Christ, his virgin birth, sinless life, atoning death, bodily resurrection, the nature of the Bible as God's inerrant word, salvation by grace through faith, the certainty of the second coming of Christ, the resurrection of the dead, the reality of heaven and hell, and the pro promise of the eternal life through Jesus Christ. True Christians have affirmed all of these doctrines, but we are not talking about these today. These are fundamental, non-negotiable doctrines. We are looking at category two disagreements, areas of doctrine or practicing not involving the above. So I want to talk to you about seven principles when you have disagreement. What is God's will for you in that? The first, remember that though all Christians worship the same Lord, they don't always agree on every point. The list of denominations will tell you that. Christians unite around Jesus and argue about everything else. Principle number two, on issues of deep personal conviction, disagreements will sometimes be very sharp. Ooh, yell, shout, scream. God can hear. Hello, it's God's church. Now the, these two, their argument was unending, unyielding, ongoing, heated, intense, deep disagreement. It was not only continual, it was contentious. The more they argued, the more the angrier they got. If you are people oriented, you will say Barnabas was right. All of us have an opinion, right? If you are mission oriented, you will say Paul was right. Regardless of who is right or wrong, we know that there was a sharp, violent disagreement between these two men. Number three, separation may ultimately be preferable 
to continual disagreement nothing in this text shows us that they got down on their knees and prayed for god's wisdom when you have an disagreement with someone get down on your knees and ask god to show you the answer to your problem romans 12:18 says if it is possible as much as depends on you 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 live at peace with all men very interesting if possible okay if possible is it possible with god all things are possible sometimes outward unity isn't possible this is hard for some of us to admit sometimes separation may ultimately be preferable to continual unending quarreling and disagreement the command to unity is always there given by jesus but sometimes we will have to obey it separately why because we can't see eye to eye with one another the bible shows us that all the people in the bible who were not angels they were men with strong feeling and with strong conviction principle 4 god works is sometimes advanced through disagreement before there are two men one team they visit one place at a time after the disagreements there are four men two teams and two places that they can go alternatively the gospel is now spread in various directions because of this disagreement romans 8:28 says and we know that all things work together for good to those who love god to those who are called according to his purpose when we say and we know that in all things even in sharp disagreements throughout church history christian movement has grown through disagreement i'm not in favor of church splits but god is sometimes able to use the disagreement to advance the cause of christ when the battle is over when the tempers have cooled when our anger is gone then we can hear the voice of the lord saying follow me i will guide you so get the temperature down if you want to hear from god <clears throat> the next principle if we must separate from one another let us do so with respect not with rancor very very important rancor means bitter deep seated ill will anger or bitterness we don't have to agree on everything but we can disagree without being disagreeable that means don't have character assassination three things warning signals to show you that you have crossed the line from justifiable disagreement to anger and bitterness when the issue becomes a controlling passion you want to get at it you want to talk only about that number 2 when you start attacking the person and not the problem attacking the problem means studying the issue sorting out the good and the bad points thinking through ways looking at things uh, how you can bring a solution attacking the person means losing your temper questioning motives using intimidation to get your own way in the heat of the controversy you spread rumors tell stories twist facts in order to make someone look bad it doesn't matter how big or how small the issue is you ought to discuss it rationally without stooping to rumor and character assassination when you would rather talk about the problems your issues rather than about jesus christ sometimes our message to the world is god loves you but we hate each other too often we fight so much about secondary things that jesus 
agenda is pushed aside. That is why the world, when you say, I'm going out to give the good news, I'm going for evangelism, they are not willing to hear because you're fighting with other Christians. When you go to share the word, it has no power. Something has gone wrong in your spiritual life. Sometimes people love to say, there's no spiritual food. I say, if you have, are hungry, you're looking for food, automatically you go to the refrigerator to find what you can eat. Well, if you are, think you're spiritually low, please go to the Bible. You find all that you need right here. Don't keep it on the mantle and say that I am dry. I'm spiritually dry. My church is not giving me anything. The Bible is with you. You need to read it daily to get your spiritual muscles up. If we have to disagree, and sometimes we do, and if we have to go our separate ways, sometimes we do, then let us disagree agreeably with respect and not rancor. Point six, in Christ, our ultimate goal should be eventual reconciliation and the restoration of friendship. Paul thought that John Mark was a quitter. Did he change his opinion? Yes, he did later. Fifteen years later, when Paul is imprisoned in Rome, Colossians 4.10 tells us, Erastichus, my fellow prisoner, greets you with Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, about whom you received instruction. If he comes to you, welcome him. John, Mark, and Paul are not only friends now, and now that Paul is in prison, John, Mark, the quitter, is taking care of him. Three years more later, that is 18 years later, Paul is in jail for the last time. He will be beheaded next. In his last days, Paul wanted John, Mark, by his side. Once Paul, Mark, they didn't want any, Paul didn't want anything to do with him because he thought he was a quitter. But at the end of his life, Paul is saying, bring him to me, I need him. That's what the gospel of Jesus Christ does. It thinks about reconciliation. Not today, maybe, not tomorrow, maybe, but eventually. I tell you, when time passes, usually we forget what the person has done to us. The person may do it over and over again. That's when you keep them away. But when, after a few years, you think, what was that? It seems such a tiny thing. Today, it may be standing right up in front of you. I say, let it go. God can forgive and help us to forget. The last principle, hold your convictions firmly, yet graciously, knowing that God may lead someone else differently than he has led you. What an important truth for us as the family of God. Romans 14, 5 says, let each one of us be fully convinced in his own mind. What do you think you get convinced about it first? And then Romans 15, 5 to 6 says, Now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another according to Jesus Christ, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God of the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we are all here for today, to glorify the Father. God places a high value on Christian unity. Hold on to your conviction in a loving fashion. After all, your convictions could change later on. A few helpful strategies for you to deal with disagreement. When you are in disagreement, work hard to see the other's point of view. It begins with good listening. When both sides have validity, seek a wise reasonable compromise. When conflict persists, care enough to work through rather than walk out. Number four, when it cannot be resolved, graciously agree to disagree without becoming disagreeable. I think Paul and Barnabas did that. You know, the best example would be Jesus hanging on the cross. In Luke 23, 34, he's looking at all of those people who have put him on the cross 
and he says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And I tell you today, we do not know what we are doing. Ask God for help so that you will see eye to eye of what God wants to do with his church. We stand at the foot of the cross looking at the Savior. All of us are in need of his grace. There's, when he has given you grace and saved you, you need to give grace to others so that God's work carries on. We must receive God's grace and offer it to others. None of us deserve it, but we all need it. Remember that. So I want to conclude. We are different, and that's okay. We don't agree on everything, and that's okay. Sometimes in the family of God, we are going to disagree strongly. That's also okay. Sometimes we are going to disagree to the point that we can't even work together anymore. That's okay too. Sometimes we are going to walk in different ways, and that's okay. We don't have to all go to the same church and belong to the same denomination to believe in the same way on controversial issues, but we do have to love one another. That's a non-negotiable command. No matter how much or how passionately you disagree with one another, you still got to love one another. Don't grumble when others don't see eye to eye or think about it in the same way. Do, you, do what you believe to be right before the Lord and let God worry about the other people. That brings me back to the question that I asked before. Who was right, Paul or Barnabas? I don't think the Bible answers that question, but I'm glad it is not answered. So many of our arguments end up the same way. When it's all over, you're not totally sure who was right or who was wrong. Even after you study both the sides, you can see some points of favor here and some points of favor there. As long as we live in this fallen world, we are going to have disagreements. And most of our disagreements will end up in the same way. When we get to heaven, our Lord will reveal the truth to us. Between now and then, there's going to be plenty of disagreements in the church, in your home, at your workplace. That's part of the price we pay because we are human. But we have the opportunity to deal with disagreements honestly and graciously because we are Christians. He makes the difference in our lives. What do you think we should do when Christians disagree? Hold your conviction and hold it in love. Amen. So let's pray that whatever you have, if you are having an issue with anyone, let it be that the Lord will tell you what you need to do. Worship team, let's rise up. I want to pray with you. Anyone with disagreements, you know what it is. Whether it's in your home, whether it's at your workplace, whether it's in your church, whether anywhere. I want to pray with you that even if you don't see eye to eye, that God will give you the grace to help to forgive them so that God is able to show you mercy. You know the Our Father? Let's recite the Our Father together today. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from all evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. What did you pray? Forgive them. You want to be forgiven? You please forgive them. So ask the Holy Spirit to bring to your mind anyone whom you don't want to forgive, who you think has hurt you so much. 
that you don't want to forgive. But if you want God's forgiveness, I tell you, release that person now. Now. So that you can be at peace with God. Father, we just come into your presence. Master, we are human. We tend to make mistakes. We tend to think that we are always right. But Lord, you know the whole situation. Even if that person is wrong, Lord, help us to forgive. You have said, vengeance is mine. You have said to pray for your enemies. Lord, you died for the enemies, you died for friends, and you died for us. You were merciful to everyone. Help us to be merciful to others as well. Lord, as we come into your presence, we ask that you will forgive us first and we can reach out to others and forgive them. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for redeeming me. Thank you for all that you have done for me. You have done so much for me and yet I'm hanging on to this little thing. Lord, help us to forgive and forget. Lord, as we come today, we just want to say thank you. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for redeeming us. We give you all the praise, all the honor, all the glory. In Jesus' mighty and matchless name we pray. Do you feel at peace? Really, I tell you, don't go to bed today without forgiving. Write on a piece of paper whoever the Lord brings to your mind and say, Lord, I forgive. You've forgiven me so much. This is nothing, Lord. Thank you. The prayer teams will be available after the service for prayer. For the benediction, please rise. Aim for perfection. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. May God the Father prepare your journey. Jesus the Son guide your footsteps. The spirit of life strengthen your body. The three in one watch over you on every road that you take. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and forevermore. Amen. My love to you all in Christ Jesus. <laughs>